So it's been a while since I've done any kind of uh, interview. It's always been, uh, I've been doing a lot of live streams on, on YouTube. I uh, saw, yeah. Where my, you know, my business manager, Chris and I, we just, um, we kind of get together and just kind of have, have people ask questions. And I plan on just doing that one time and it turned into this thing where we do it every week. And uh, it's actually done pretty well. Um, mm-hmm. Mainly just to kind of get the message out of whatever product I'm working on or what, where a place I'm traveling to or whatever it's been, it seems to have been, been pretty popular. But, um, um, I did have you on years, a couple of years ago, I think. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Ariel, who, uh, is, is Vortex Radar, uh, from, um, you're still in, uh, in Washington. Yeah. Washington. Based up in uh, Seattle. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you, um, you are like my inspiration when it comes to anything, uh, radar detector. I don't even question it. I just <laughs> go on the site. I follow the recommended specs. I buy whatever radar you tell me to buy and I put it in my car, which is cool. very rare for me to do. Um, mm-hmm. I'm normally that guy in my life, uh, telling everybody else what to do. Uh, it's funny when the tables are turned. Yeah. It's nice to like be able to rely on somebody else. Like I was listening to your podcast. I'm like, yeah, oh, cool. And it way, comes to recommendations yeah. on it's cars, way like, yeah, and detailing, like I can just go to you or you can come to me. Like, it's nice to not always have to do the research on everything. Yeah. <laughs> such a, such a, uh, it's a much better way to live. So, yeah. uh, so what what's going on in the radar world right now? What uh, what uh, I'm is it still our uh, unit in R seven? Is that still the the way to go? For the time being, kind of depends on what you're looking for. I guess as far as the best radar detectors, R uh, seven is a popular one. Uh, the Escort Max three sixty C is a popular one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like their custom installed options too, like the Max three sixty CI. Mm-hmm. Um, Redenso Thea is the big thing that everybody's talking about now. Kind of Redenso's new upcoming radar detector. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are some of the popular ones that we're seeing right now. So Redenso is the that's the AI based thing I saw uh, Jonathan exactly. talking about at, at yeah, um, and, SEMA. Yeah, and they've started posting videos now of the development process of the build. Um, so we're kind of learning a lot as they're actually creating Thea. Hmm. So uh, if uh, if you guys haven't listened to the podcast or Ari and I Ari and I talked before, I was encouraging you or, or begging you to start selling radar detectors. Have you <laughs> have you done any of, any of that yet? Are you still? I have uh, zero interest uh, to be honest. I mean, I'm sure I would make a lot more money if I was selling direct. The margins uh-huh. would be a lot better than doing like Amazon affiliate sales and all. Yeah. But um, I don't know. Maybe at some point, like I can open up my own store. But I like having the freedom i guess to not deal with inventory and shipping and returns mm-hmm. and customer service and like i just want to focus on the testing and the reviews and the comparisons and that already takes a ton of time and so i mean i, I could expand maybe if i had somebody helping me with that and sure. you know a lot more about that than i do but i mean just for the sake of simplicity and freedom i like just kind of focusing on the testing and the videos and sure. let other people handle sales and inventory I, I still want to be i'll be the referral I'll, I'll do all the fulfillment and i'll split it with you we'll, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> I don't manage, know if I, well do you I'll compete manage. with amazon or like how does that work well so you have to remember that um you know especially you're you're the classic example of this is that people want to honor the source Mm-hmm. Right. And so, so whether or not they can get it a little bit faster or maybe they could get it, um, um, I mean, the pricing should be pretty fixed on, on things like detectors. I mean, it should be pr- reasonably well controlled. Um, and, and so in general, I mean, people like most of the stuff that I sell, people can get anywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. And s- some people are, are, are pretty selfish and they just want to go and, and get the best price or get it the, the easiest and simplest. But there's a large contingent of people that want to honor the source, you know, the source of the information. Where did they get, you know, where did they mm-hmm. get this from? Where did they get the, uh, the information? Who did they get it from? And so, you know, anytime mm-hmm. I buy a radar detector, I go to your site, I click the link. Uh, because that's the, that's the source of my information. And so mm-hmm. um, even the, the, the competitive part of it isn't as big of a, a thing as you might think because, you know, largely people want to do the right thing, you know, mm-hmm. especially the people you want. Totally, totally. I mean, you always get the people who are like, hey, Vortex, I watch your videos and I'm going to go get the radar detector. So I'm going to walk down to Best Buy and pick it up. And I'm like, well, <laughs> great. I'm glad you got the detector you want. It doesn't, I guess, financially help me, but I just consider that as like, I mean, it's going to happen. It's a cost of doing business. And ultimately, like, I'm okay with that. I would rather them, you know, use my affiliate link. That certainly helps. But I mean, it's a big pie. Like, I'm 
good as long as I'm taken care of and people get what they need. Like, yeah, I want to, you know, yeah, if they would want to support me, obviously that's a big help to me, but sure. Can't get everybody, I guess. Got it. So yeah. what's the, um, I haven't been uh, doing a whole lot of uh, radar detector research lately because I've just been buying an R7 and, you know, getting, mm-hmm. you know, putting on a blend mount and, um, yeah. what, um, um, what, what have you doing any, have you done anything uh, recently on the channel that people might find interesting? Anything crazy you've done, like as far as a, a big, uh, big test or anything, uh, what, what's been going on on the channel? A lot of stuff right now. I haven't been posting content cause I've been testing stuff privately. Um, kind of like you're always getting new products behind the scenes, which I can't always talk about and stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I get stuff from different manufacturers or I get new firmware updates for the R7 or the R3 or. So like right now I'm kind of looking at stuff behind the scenes. Um, I've been doing just some testing like earlier this morning uh, before uh, sitting down with you. I did some laser jammer testing. I'm going to be doing some more uh, after we finish here. Um, people who got ALPs installed in their car. So testing out the car. Uh, we ran into an issue with uh, the ALP and the Redenso RCM combination. So I've been talking to uh, ALP and Redenso this morning, kind of going over configuration and is a bug, maybe some bugs we've discovered or troubleshooting. So a lot of it right now is just kind of, behind the scenes, which isn't necessarily flashy, fun things to show on camera, but mm-hmm. it's kind of a lot of the things that lead up to when I'm doing a recommendation or a comparison, there's a lot of like previous work sure. and research and testing that's gone into it. So um, some of the stuff I can talk about, like the ALP, some stuff I can't, uh, but mm-hmm. that's just kind of how it is with new stuff that's coming out. So are you are you consulting with the manufacturers? I mean, what what's the... Uh... Uh, what's the relationship there? Do you do they do they hire you to do this? Do you do it uh, pro bono just to get access? What is in general? How do you, how do you get access to these people? Yeah, um, well, that's kind of funny. Like I, they don't pay me for any of this kind of stuff. I mean, I've had companies say like, "Hey, Vortex, we want to develop a new radar detector, and can we hire you on to you mm-hmm. know give advice on design or testing?" And I'm I've thought about it. I mean, I've had a couple of companies ask me, but at the end of the day, like, no, I'm not taking payment for any of this kind of stuff. Sometimes mm-hmm. they send me products early uh, in the development process and I'm happy to test it and just kind of give them my thoughts and feedback. I'm not going to be like the person responsible for the detector. That's ultimately them. But if I can help maybe uh, identify some issues or give some suggestions on new features or changes and things of how they can be implemented, mm-hmm. um, it's just ultimately going to help create a better radar detector for anybody who wants to buy it when it comes out. Um, plus, I wind up just learning more about the detector in general. So once it comes out, I'm already really familiar with it and I can give my thoughts, my reviews. I can go over the settings. I'm familiar with the nuances of what the different settings would do because I've already spent so much time just playing with it. Mm -hmm. So um, they don't pay me. A lot of the companies are just like, Hey, you know, we'll talk. Here's what we're working on. Cool. Uh, Here's a detector before it comes out, various stages of development. And I'll just go in and kind of run it for a while, share my thoughts, do some testing and give them feedback. And then it's up to them to do whatever they want to do with it. Interesting. So that, that affords you the ability to stay agnostic to stay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Like I have, I mean, relationships with the different companies as far as just talking to them and working on things, but I don't have any financial incentive to support one company over another. And I mean, it's just, I like testing them all and learning and just sharing what I find. Like that's my goal is just to understand these tools and help other people understand them too. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm really trying to accomplish here. So what does, um, when you, when you come out with a video, um, Mm -hmm. how much, uh, what would you say, you know, hours of, of, of backend. So for every hour of, (laughs) so for every hour of footage that you're publicly releasing, what's the Delta there? How much, how much time are you spending, uh, uh, doing backend research? Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm on the forums all day, every day. I'm talking to manufacturers. I'm running a different radar detector every couple of days. So like, I mean, driving my daughter to daycare, I'm running a radar detector or I'll switch a different one. Or like before this, I was doing testing and after this, I'm doing more. So I don't know if there's a number you can put to it. It's what I do full time. And then Mm -hmm. once I'm ready to shoot a video, it's, you know, okay, sit down, shoot the video, edit, get the B-roll, all that kind of stuff. Like the editing and video creation process, you know, you make videos too. Mm -hmm. It takes so much time to create each video and then all the research and testing that goes into it. I mean, it's just what I do all the time anyway. So I don't know Mm -hmm. if I could give a number like 20 to one or whatever, but yeah, there's a ton of research and, and it's tough sometimes. Like how do you take all that information and sort of compress it down into a short video that's not like an hour long or 30 minutes long, like trying to get all that information concisely presented while still presenting a lot of information and not making the videos super long. 
Mm-hmm. So that's always kind of a tricky balance. Yeah, I don't do any of that. I just make it whatever it needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> so screw the world, screw the views. Uh, I'm going to just say what I have to say. And if it takes me an hour and a half, that's what you get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and you just kind of have to mistake. be okay. Yeah, yeah. Some people will complain like, oh, why are your videos so long? Or you forgot to include this? Or yeah. why do you talk so fast? It's like, well, I drank a bunch of coffee trying to talk faster and get through all this content so you don't complain <laughs> about the video link. And so like, it's at the end, uh, after a while, it's like, here's what I found. I'll share it. If you don't like the format, okay, I'll always improve as a presenter, but you can't really cater to everybody. You just kind of do your thing. So talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, uh, Redenso's, uh, what, what do they call it? What's the brand of it called? Yeah. So the detector is going to be called Thea. Thea. Okay. Uh, there wasn't a name. I don't think at SEMA yet. Um, there so. wasn't. Yeah. Well, actually was there, I don't know there might've been, I don't know if he had I a name. I think before. there was, but they didn't make a big deal about it. We were just calling it like the Redenso AI detector because Thea, mm-hmm. I mean, nobody knows what that means. It's like the Roman or Greek goddess of sight, I think mm-hmm. is the name of it. Um, but yeah, I guess the cool thing about it is most radar detectors up to this point, they've been really similar fundamentally under the hood. Um, I mean, they've been using the same technology for literally decades. Uh, there will be some improvements to the software side and the filtering to try to filter out false alerts. You know, they add GPS functionality for lockouts, or maybe they'll add Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. but fundamentally they've all been pretty similar in their operation under the hood. Um, it's right. mostly been some maybe new horn that they'll design or try to improve the filterings of false alerts and BSMs. That's a big thing these days. But uh, one of the tough things that a lot of manufacturers are running into is two things. Number one, the radar detectors themselves physically cannot see the difference between different signals, whether it's a blind spot false or a police radar gun. So they just are going to false alert because they literally have no way of differentiating mm-hmm. what the different signals are. The second thing is with some of them, they can tell the difference. But in order to create a filter to say this is a radar gun or this is a blind spot false, you need some really talented engineers. Um, And people who are capable of doing this are usually working for the military. They're working for Microsoft or Google or some of these like super massive companies that can afford to pay them tons of money. So usually people are going there. And the only person who's going to go to a radar detector company is somebody who loves radar detectors. Right. And so getting the talent to create these radar detectors is actually pretty challenging to do in the first place. So Mm -hmm. one of the things that Redenso is doing is they're like, okay, well, let's build new hardware that can actually see the difference fundamentally between all these different signals. And then second, they're designing artificial intelligence that can learn all by itself the difference between a radar gun and a uh, blind spot false or a door opener. Like It can just see the difference and classify them automatically. And so instead of relying on engineers to constantly have to update their detectors and write new algorithms to filter out these different alerts, the detector can just learn to do it itself, which is the AI. Mm Kind of like how, you know, Facebook can tag your face. Like it just learns your face. There's not somebody behind the scenes who's sitting there and saying, oh, this is Matt. His eyes are spaced this far apart and his mouth looks like they just, the computer can kind of figure all that out. Mm -hmm. And Redenso is applying the same sort of technology to classifying different types of radar signals. And so as they're going out and recording all sorts of different signals, they can then train their radar detectors to just tell the difference. And so now the detectors are going to be able to actually tell the difference between false alerts and real alerts. And in theory, we should have no more false alerts. And if new signals start coming out, whether they're new blind spot falses or new radar guns or whatever, they can just get a recording of it, train on that signal, and then release an update. And boom, the detector can now support it. And so the speed of updates over time becomes much, much quicker too. Mm. I was fascinated when I saw... You know what he was talking about, and it made perfect sense that you know yeah. all these all these little black boxes are all pretty much the same from the beginning of time. You know, <laughs> I've been are. driving, you yeah, know? and you know, and and you know, of course, Valentine, you know, had the you know had the directional arrows, and then you know, mm-hmm. and then that pattern is up, and now that's open, and so other than that, it's been all pretty much the same thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that, that intrigues me. So what's the time frame on that? Is it this year? That's what everybody's been wondering. They're saying that it's going to be out this year, but we have mm-hmm. no idea when it's going to come out uh, as far as release. Like they're still very much developing it, testing it, putting it together. Like a video that they posted on their channel the other day was just talking about the, uh, the knob on the front and the way the menu is going to work and all the testing they did to find the right feel and design for the knob, for the mm-hmm. control. So like they're still very much putting it together. Um, when we were at SEMA... Uh, they had like kind of the 
I wouldn't call maybe kind of like a prototype, but they had Thea itself running under the hood. Yeah. Uh, the hardware. And I mean, they had like a Max 360C and I think an R3 there. And both of those two detectors were falsing to just some of the blind spot mm-hmm. companies that were around because, you know, automotive electronics. And so those sure. two detectors were sitting there falsing to just DSMs effectively at the show or door openers, whereas Theo was over there just sitting quiet and it could tell you the signals were present. It could alert to the door opener when you turn it on, but like it was already functioning and doing things that the other detectors are unable to do. Now, when that's going to come out to a detector we can put on the windshield, all we know is it's this year at some point, but we don't know exactly when, what quarter even. So and we're all this isn't going to be a custom install. It's going to be a box that goes on the windshield or on your, you know, rearview mirror or something like that. Yeah. So the first one they're going to release is going to be a uh, a windshield mount. So mm-hmm. kind of like the R7. So it's going to be a windshield mount, and then yeah. eventually they're going to take the same technology and put it into a custom installed package. Uh, they'll do different form factors and all, but the first one, like they really want to make a statement. So it's going to have all the bells and whistles. It'll have uh, arrows. It's going to have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Uh, it's going to have an open API. So other third-party developers can uh, kind of like with the V1, mm-hmm. they can write apps to interface with the detector and add functionality. Uh, the detector itself, it's basically a Linux computer. Mm-hmm. And they're going to give you the ability to go in and even add features directly to the detector you want or change the interface. Like they're going to give you the ability to modify the detector. You could, I mean, it's super modular. So if you wanted it, you could take its AI technology and have it scan for non-radar sources. If you wanted to scan for radio signals or satellite signals, like fundamentally, you could just hook up a different antenna and have it scan all sorts of different stuff. So the technology is being implemented specifically for police radar detection, but there's a ton of possibilities of what people can actually do with it because it's so different. And mm-hmm. so new than anything else we've seen before. Yeah, and uh, I know that he was, you know, targeting somewhere under a thousand bucks. So we're not talking a five thousand dollar thing. We're yeah, talking about something reasonable. Yeah, so he's wanting to be. He said it's going to be the most expensive windshield mount, which currently is the Max Three Hundred and Sixty C, which is six hundred and fifty. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know this is going to be more expensive than that, but we don't know exactly how much more. I think you mentioned, yeah, it'll be a thousand or less, somewhere yeah. in that range. But yeah. we don't know eight hundred, nine hundred. We don't really know. That's fascinating. So th- this could change the game, you know, change the the whole the whole thing. So yeah, one one question I'd have for you that a lot of people you know tend to make comments in my videos is why do you need a radar detector? Why don't you just use Waze? <laughs> right? Why don't you just yeah. use Waze? That's good enough. That's Waze is an awesome tool. I run Waze all the time. It's a fantastic complement to a radar detector, but mm-hmm. it's not a replacement for a radar detector. Uh, Waze, I mean, the way that it works is, yeah, you go in the app and you mark when you see police officer. Mm -hmm. And so Waze is going to be great if the officer is already there, if he's already been previously marked. But if he just arrived and he's shooting radar, your radar detector will alert, even if Waze hasn't marked him yet. Mm -hmm. Um, If he's dark, if he's hidden, and people haven't been able to see him there, then yeah, he's not going to be on Waze. And Waze is going to be most effective against police officers using laser, not so much with radar. And with laser, the officer has to be stationary in order to hold the laser gun and target cars one by one. Mm -hmm. And so when he's parked on the side of the road shooting laser, yeah, people can easily mark him on ways. And so laser jammers are more expensive and sometimes they're illegal. And so some people will be like, hey, you know, I'm maybe going to skip getting a laser jammer um, and I'm just going to rely on ways. Uh, Some people will do that. But again, you run into issues. What if he's not marked and all that kind of stuff? Um, And the ways alert distance is pretty minimal. So anyway, I think it's, if we're talking about an alternative, I think it's better suited to laser. With radar, police can actually use it not only when they're stationary, but also when they're driving. Mm -hmm. So they can just be rolling around. And so, I mean, if they're moving, you can't mark them on ways. And that's really where the radar detector kicks in to let you know where the officer's around, whether they're stationary, whether they're moving. So that's kind of why, like, yeah, ways is an awesome tool, but I see it more as a complement to a radar detector or a laser jammer. It's not necessarily a replacement for one. If for me, where I am, I mean, there's a lot of old people and it's rather rural. And it's yeah. Just not, it's, you know, no one's, no one's using that. You know? If you don't have cell service, if it's a bunch of old people not using their phones to mark them, then. Yeah. Then, not yeah. all my cars have like a cell phone mount, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, actually none of them do right now. So I don't have my cell phone out all the time when I'm driving around. And so yeah. to me, it, it just does. I'd rather have just a simple setup. You know, hopefully it's doing some filtering, but Mm -hmm. just sitting on my dash telling me what to do. You know, that's, that's what I need. There you go. Yeah. Instead of having to be managing all these gosh darn devices when I'm trying to drive around. 
you know, because mm-hmm. you know, I, especially as I find it as I get older, I'm not aggressively speeding anywhere where I mm-hmm. need the detector is when I'm on a back country road and it's speed limit is 35 and I'm doing 70 or mm-hmm. 80 because I can and mm-hmm. uh, I've got big brakes. So yep. I need that to just keep me out of jail, you know, when, when yeah. I'm, you know, when I'm under control, you know, but I'm clearly, you know, exceeding the limit, you know, of what, yeah. what would be recommended in a normal regular car under normal circumstances. Yeah. And the R7 that you're running, it's a great choice for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm, what I'm looking for. You know, custom installs always intrigue me, but I always have too many cars and I always change them too much. Mm-hmm. So to spend the money, you know, four or five, six, eight thousand dollars to do, you know, the, the ALP, AL priority or to do, you know, so laser and custom radar, it just doesn't, doesn't, isn't, doesn't make practical sense. Yeah. And I mean, I'm even running into that issue because I've got, I think, four custom installed radar detectors and I'm like, well, they're all about to be eclipsed by Thea when that comes mm-hmm. out or even sidestepping that, like I've got some laser jammers, uh, TMG just released their new VPR heads. So the laser jammers that I have right now, there's a new version of it and I can't easily swap them out. Um, or Stinger, there's a new, uh, uh, a new antenna that I don't have. It's the new HD plus antenna, which gives even better performance than the one that I'm running. And so if I want to upgrade to the newest version, like it's a pain to go in. Yeah, and you're pulling body fast. panels off and yeah, because it's it's yeah. usually uh, aren't the like the the laser jammers, the laser sensors, they're normally not plugged in at the at the end, they're plugged in at the at the brain. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you can't just unplug and put a new one in. You have to pull the whole wire out and rewire the whole darn thing. Depending on what system you're using. Yeah. I mean, even yeah. Escort, when you switch from the 9500CI to the Mac CI, completely mm-hmm. new wiring, even though it's mm-hmm. still Escort. So to go to a new system. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times you're pulling, you're having to run new wires and like it's, yeah, pull body panels. It's a big deal. Yeah. I think I've done a couple of customs in the past. Uh, what was the original Escort? Was it SR1, I think? Oh man, like the SRX or something from years ago. This would be from like 2000. Yeah. 2001. Yeah. That's, I think like that's the last before I, I even got into radar detectors. That's yeah. yeah. So uh, on, on that subject of getting into radar detectors, what, what, what else are you this interested in, in life? What other things do you have a, a passion for like this? It's funny. I mean, right now, this is my biggest passion and it's what I focus on, but I mean, I love driving. I love cameras. I used to be into photography before mm-hmm. getting into videos and all. Um, so I used to just spend time on the forums reading about different cameras and lenses, primarily Canon, I shot Canon for like 15 years. And I just switched to Sony for the videos to for the 4K and the autofocus during video and stuff. But um, before I got into reviews, I was just spending time learning about cameras and lenses. And mm-hmm. I mean, just sharpness, the way they work at different apertures. And I just loved learning everything. So that was something I was super into. And now I can take a lot of the photography background and then apply it to videos in YouTube, which has been super helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what? Where does this go? What do you What do you do next? I mean, what What is? I mean, has it become? It's, I don't get the sense that it feels like a job. I mean, what What do you? Where Where do you see yourself in in Let's say five years from now with with radar. Yeah, it's funny. Like at this point, I love what I'm doing, and I love having the freedom to kind of do what I want and set my own schedule. I get to play with toys for a living just about, just about and you know, share them with people online. So I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. And I think as far as growth, I'm kind of getting to the point where I'd rather have, I'd like to have some help and like creating content takes so much time. So maybe I want to focus on shooting the videos and I can have somebody help me edit the videos mm-hmm. so that I can get on to shooting the next one. So um, I've been like brought on, you know, an accountant to help with the business and the taxes. So I don't have to do the taxes myself anymore or, Um, I mean, just, it's, I think kind of getting help to grow this so that I can focus on the things that I enjoy the most, which is the testing, the research and the content creation. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it now comes down to like growing this or getting people to help me with website design or SEO type stuff. A lot of it is kind of growing the business so -hmm. that it can be, I just really want to focus my time on the things that I enjoy the most and less so on everything else, which I guess if you run your own business and you're responsible for literally everything you have to wear many hats and you have to do things that aren't necessarily your passion. And either it means you got to do it yourself and learn how, or you have to bring somebody else on board to do it. Mm -hmm. So right now it's just bringing other people to help me do the things that I'm not good at, or I don't want to do. So you would spend all of your time research. Yeah. Research, testing and and creating material and presenting. And then I'm like, okay, well I'll help you, you know, edit the videos, maybe somebody else. And then I can get on to doing the next thing. Cause like I've been working on a, uh, 
a dash cam comparison right now. I've got uh, three dash cams I'm running right now, front and rear, and it takes even so much time to just sit down and be like, okay, well, I need this situation in the daytime, cloudy versus sunny conditions, front camera versus rear camera, and try to really see the nuances on which one has the best quality. Uh, how do they compare in terms of stopping action and freezing a license plate when a car is driving by? And even just going through and doing the research takes a ton of time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is like, okay, I've got my, I've done the research. I've got my results and the conclusion. Now I know what I want to say in the video. Let's go shoot it and put it all together. And it's just that process takes so much time. And I'd yeah. like to test more dash cams and review more stuff. And I'm just having to figure out like how to speed up this process because it's so time consuming. Yeah, you're you're thinking, you know, that 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 makes a lot of sense to 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 you know delegate out the tasks that don't require you to do it, so you can leverage your time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, then, how do you pay for them through affiliate marketing, affiliate links, and yeah, affiliate links. From? Yeah, that's the main thing that I do. So, if somebody wants to buy a radar detector or a laser jammer, they can use an affiliate link on my website. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the main thing that I do as far as how people support me and how I'm able to do this. Uh, there's also things like uh, Patreon. So if people sign up for Patreon, they can give that way. Um, some people, like I also offer private sessions. So if you don't want to spend hours and hours doing research, you know, watching videos or reading my website and all that kind of stuff, and you're just like, let's talk about where I drive, mm -hmm. uh, what my preferences are, what car I drive, we can just kind of go over everything directly. And mm -hmm. then we'll go over where do you install the laser jammers on your car to make sure they're most effective. Um, and so I'll do private sessions with people. Uh, there's YouTube ads. So when the videos sure. play, but that's maybe 10% of what I make. It's not a huge amount. Um, sure. So the majority of it is affiliate links. So how does, how do people, they, through your website, do they submit a fill out a form and submit and uh, like, what does that cost? Like, let's say I, you know, I'm getting a GT4. Uh, I want to do uh, I want to, I want to consult. What do I, yeah. how do I do that? Totally. Yeah. I'm meeting up with the guy who's got a, a GT3 RS after this. Um, and we're going to test out his ALP on his car. And so pretty much you just go to uh, my website, uh, mm -hmm. vortexradar.com. And there's a link at the top for uh, private sessions. Mm -hmm. And you can click on that. And then you can just go book a private session there. It's uh, 90 bucks. Got it. And then we can sit down and go over everything over email, over phone, in person, if you're in the Seattle area, kind of whatever works best. Well, that's cool. That's smart. I like that. Yeah. Yes. So um, do you, you, do you, you don't do any installs on things, do you? <laughs> Correct. I don't do the installs myself. I guess that's one of the things where I focus on what I'm good at. And then I let the professionals, you know, like they handle the installs. Like I go to professional installers to get the installs done. Yeah. I've done them before on my I did a Hyundai Sonata. I had a Mazda Miata. I drove and I did the installs myself on those. But for my current one, like I wanted something that was much more professional yeah. and well done and integrated. So I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, let's go to a pro and have them do it. And it was so much better and way less of a headache. I get that periodically where people are like, uh, I want you to, they, they have this, they, they do this all the time. I've got this great idea. They probably do this to you too. <laughs> get this amazing idea. So you fly to my house mm -hmm. and I'll let you work on my garage <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and then, uh, then you can make a video of it. Mm -hmm. Dude, that, that, that's not, that doesn't sound like fun to me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, and, and a lot of times it's, oh, and you get to pay, I get to pay for it all too, you know, so I yeah, get to pay like, for the, all the equipment, but they'll let me, you know, come and, and do this all for them. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. how nice of them. That's so generous of them. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even, I, so I'm Mr. Detailing and all five of my cars are freaking disaster, you know, they're all dirty and uh -huh. um, I don't technically have a garage and, mm -hmm. uh, and I, all I have is a carport. And, and uh, yeah, so, so uh, I, how, how have you managed um, opportunity, you know, of, of, you know, where you have things coming at you from all angles, like you'd, you'd be very clear, like I'm not interested in, in, in buying and managing inventory and shipping out and dealing with that. So how mm -hmm. have you stayed focused on, on, you know, staying in your lane and what, what you're good at and what you're interested in. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, some of the opportunities you've had that maybe you've kind of walked away from or, or not, not um, followed up with. And then maybe in a, a time where you went a little too far and had to kind of rein yourself in. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I was actually listening to your podcast earlier today where you were talking about that exact thing. And I know you gave a talk in Atlanta about it and all. And, uh, yeah. So that's been an interesting thing. A lot of it is just kind of trial and error and figuring out like, what is it that you like and what are you passionate about? And I found like with radar detectors, for example, I love them, 
but it's also kind of a small market. It's hard to create a massive YouTube channel if you're focusing on a pretty tight, small niche. So mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm also interested in laser jammers. I'm also interested in dash cams. And I remember I would uh, expand into dash cams and cover them too. And it was a natural fit. Like my YouTube channel actually started to compare different dash cams. I just mm -hmm. needed a place to like post dash cam footage and take it, show like, oh, this one does this and that one does that. Mm -hmm. And then once I started getting the dash cams, I'm like, oh, it's an easier way for me to do radar detector testing and it all kind of evolves. So it was a natural fit for uh, also testing dash cams. But one thing I started to find is it takes way more time to test dash cams than it does with radar detectors. Plus with radar detectors, there's far fewer options. There's, I don't know, 10, 20, like good radar detectors out on the market. Right. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of dash cams. And there's constantly more of them coming out. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to realistically test all of them. Like I'm testing three right now. And that's going to take me several weeks to do that. Uh, my last dash cam review, just the video itself took about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And if I want to focus on that, that means like setting aside time for everything else just to do one review video. And it was a great video. It was almost half an hour long with like a ton of detail and everything, which is why it takes so much time. But eventually I kind of start finding like, where am I overextending myself? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Ooh, I like the dash cam stuff, but there's no way I can realistically test every single one. And people are like, Oh, Vortex, what about this one? What about that one? And it kind of bugs me because I can't test every single thing mm -hmm. and there's no way I can actually be an expert in every single option and know the details of how every single dash cam compares when there's thousands and thousands of them. Plus my actual passion is much more radar detectors and laser jammers. Mm -hmm. So it's like dash cams take less, well, they take more time and I'm honestly less interested in those. Mm -hmm. So that's something where I kind of have to like take a step back and say, I can't put in the same amount of uh, focus and energy into dash cams, even though I like expanding them and I like covering them. But to me, that's almost secondary. So I've had to like take a step back to some extent and say, I have to kind of let that go by the wayside a little bit and really focus in on the radar detectors, which is what I love. That's what I want to spend all my free time doing. And that's not to say where I can be of the most help to people, but that's just what I love the most. So mm -hmm. a lot of it is just seeing, you know, where can I help people? Where do I have to put limits? Uh, or even things, a big one is people constantly asking me for help, you know, messaging me on Instagram or Twitter or email and like, I can't spend a ton of time answering questions privately and then also still having the time to make the videos and do my testing and research or spend time mm -hmm. with my family or, you know, I it just kind of starts to overextend myself. I used to try doing that and I wound up kind of getting burned out mm -hmm. and it's like, I can't be customer service and tech support for everybody who owns a unit a Redenso an escort <laughs> an ALP, a black view, a think where like, I, I can't, if you want, you know, if you need customer service, there's entire companies who like have people dedicated to that. So, right. you know, I don't want to be like, here's my reviews on a radar detector. And if you have an issue, sorry, sucks for you. Go contact customer service. I don't necessarily want to do that. So it's kind of tricky finding a balance of saying like, all right, here's my recommendations in the reviews. And here's maybe some common issues that I see that you may run into when say updating this radar detector or this thing may overheat in that situation or common things that people may run into. Cause I definitely still want to help people out. But I also have to draw the line on saying, I can't answer every question privately. I can't be customer service for everybody. And I guess one of the nice things about YouTube is if I see a lot of people asking the same question, um, I can just spend time to create the answer to make a video, answering that question really well once, and mm -hmm. then having that question available for thousands and thousands of people having that video, as opposed to answering the same question privately over and over and over. So I kind of have to like put restrictions on answering people privately, even though I still really love helping people and like mm -hmm. just find the best way that I can help people is to kind of set boundaries and then just try answering stuff on the forums or on Facebook or uh, in the YouTube videos or a way, just a way that lots of people can all see the answers without me having to constantly repeat myself. So it's been tricky actually finding those limits and setting boundaries and balances like that, especially when you love helping people. So do you just not respond to the question? A lot of times, yeah. I mean, I try to be nice and like say, you know, I'd love to help you with that. Would you mind maybe uh, asking me publicly on the forums or on Facebook or just a way like we can discuss it to where you can get the answer. I'm able to help out a lot of other people and anybody else who's wondering the same thing. They can also benefit from the discussion if you simply maybe ask on the forums instead of in an Instagram private message. And sometimes I just don't respond just because I can't respond to everybody. 
Right. Um, or you've responded and, to the same thing six times in the last couple of days. Yeah, so it's it's kind of tricky sometimes. Yeah, it's really interesting you you talk about that. You know, I, I get that a lot with uh, with a lot of the products that I now sell, and mm-hmm. <laughs> there's nothing more frustrating than you know, in my case where somebody be like I bought an MTM foam cannon from Amazon and I bought a an MTM gun from Adams. And uh, now I need to know what fittings to buy. So the fittings are like $12. And mm-hmm. so they want me who to, to then answer exactly what fittings to buy that likely mm-hmm. they'll end up buying from Amazon anyway, uh, <laughs> because they'll see that I'm going to charge them $3 to ship it. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it's, it's one of those things where like, I want to help, but you know, we probably get 45 of those questions every day, the exact same thing of, hey, I bought all the high dollar stuff from somebody else and now I want you to tell me how to fix it. You know, how, mm-hmm. do I, how do I put it together? So now what I do is I say, hey, here's what I might suggest. Return all of that other stuff and then buy <laughs> these three things and then you won't, have to, you, know, you won't have to try to beat your head against the wall trying to get the right fittings. But in the beginning, I was so scared to say that. Mm-hmm. Um, where, or what I would do is I'd get mad and say, so wait a minute, you're asking me to tell you how to, how to put it together when you bought it somewhere else, get out of here. Uh, <laughs> so now what I do is I just suggest, or I'll have Kyle suggest, Hey, um, why don't you return that stuff and we'll help you get the right stuff, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and then they can nicely, then they can decide whether they understand that we're not going to give them the free information unless mm-hmm. they, you know, buy the stuff from us. Totally. But, yeah. But yeah. That's a, that's a struggle. It's hard to, to let that go, you know, mm-hmm. and to not answer. So mm-hmm. do you on, on like YouTube and stuff, do you follow up on all the comments? Do you read through them all? Oh yeah. I read every single comment. Yeah. Um, I don't always respond to them. I always try to respond nicely. I respond to most of them, but I can't respond to every single one, just time constraints and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, you run into some trolls and, you know, sometimes <laughs> I'll respond and be nice and, you know, courteous and be like, no, okay. You know, in the back of my head, oh, you're completely misunderstanding. That's not what I was saying at all. Or you have no idea what you're talking about. It's actually da da da. But you don't want to like argue with them necessarily. You so um, you never type that. You don't know what you're talking about. No, I've never said that. Oh, um, really? I, just, I do that every day, at least ten <laughs> times a day. <laughs> but there's, I mean, I figure if somebody's coming and they're doing their research, of course they're not going to know everything. They're coming because they're interested in learning more information, and I'm just helpful, or I'm just yeah. hoping that they're open-minded enough to listen and consider new ideas. If they're not, mm-hmm. that's on them. They can do whatever they want. It doesn't ultimately affect me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm just happy like sharing the information and they can do with it what they want. Hopefully they're going to support me in return too, but I just want to make this information available because um, I guess maybe with you know car detailing, there's a ton of information about it, right. but with radar detectors, I think it's an even smaller niche and there's less yeah. information. So I'm just really wanting people to have the information so they can at least make an educated and informed decision. And if they want to reject it or they want to argue, that's on you. It's cool. Information's out there. Do with it what you want. Yeah. Car detailing's changed a lot because when I started, there was the chemical guys channel. There was Larry Casilla, MO NYC channel. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and there was the junk man and that was basically it. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and then I started it and I started my channel. I started long format videos and, and, mm-hmm. you know, now today there's, there's a tons and tons of, uh, resources available to, to get information. But yeah, in the beginning it was, you know, I, my style, my type of, of, of video, uh, well, I'm probably still one of the few that does it my way. Uh, because I'm doing the opposite of the way you should do it. Um, but I've, I'm considering um, um, not being as active in the comments in the future. I totally get that, yeah. I mean, it's, it, yeah, you just kind of have to. And I mean, if you watch YouTubers who have like, you know, millions and millions of subscribers, they don't they're even, not going to respond. Yeah. They don't respond to, at like, all. Comment. Yeah, so and I mean it's nice to like put yourself out there and to talk to people and, you know, be more personal and Mm -hmm. stuff. But you know, if there's only one of you and there's hundreds of thousands of subscribers or millions of people watching your videos, there's, you just can't respond to everybody, even if you want to. So it's just tricky to have to set those boundaries Mm -hmm. and set a balance there. Yeah. Because I'm still, I'm sure you're this way too. I can still go through each one. Now it's a lot of work. It's, it's probably an hour, hour and a half a day. Uh, totally. But, you know, I, I probably get an average of, you know, two or 300 comments a day or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. It's not two or 3,000, which clearly would be impossible. But, you know, I can mm-hmm. still get through them. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, again, I don't respond to everyone, but I'll hit the stupid little, I hate hearts. I wish it wasn't a heart. 
<laughs> but you know, so that they know you read it. I hate uh-huh. that. Um, but but uh, I'll, I'll you know, and I'll respond to the ones, and and I'll tell people you know, shut your face, you're stupid, you know, that kind of thing. Uh-huh. Or you know, sometimes it's fun to mess with them when you just. You know, you just either agree with their ridiculousness or disagree with it or however, you know, sometimes I'll just try to, I'll just try to dismiss it as much as possible. But yeah, oh, totally. it'd be, it be a lot smarter if I was a politician rather than, a, <laughs> than me. It's like, yeah, we're YouTubers. We're not politicians. Because <laughs> no one would say that to me to my face. Ever. No, of course not. No, it's yeah. People like they'll, I guess it's just the internet or it's YouTube comments in general. Anybody who's ever read YouTube comments, you're like, nobody does that except for on the internet it's weird yeah. uh, like i've got this one guy who creates a new fake uh fake profile all the time he thinks he's figured me out he thinks mm-hmm. that he's figured out how i'm lying to everybody and how um you know i, I only sell products that uh, i can sell and that uh, i'm just i'm just not being truthful and so he has it's pretty it seems pretty pretty sharp you know types of full sentences and everything but it's very clear <laughs> it's the same guy and he cre- yeah. he's probably created about seven new uh new anonymous profiles and so then I, he gets me all the time, though. I, I answer the question. Uh, like the last one was um, something about G Technic and how I don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm literally like sitting next to the CEO of G Technic <laughs> at the G Technic <laughs> conference where I'm the keynote speaker. And the guy's telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's just ironic at times when, you know, trolls are just, yeah, they, they're frustrating. So I, like, I'm considering letting it go and just not, not responding. Yeah. I think you just kind of have to, like, even if you're trying to respond, you just kind of eventually hit your limits. And you don't really have a choice other than to just say, no, I, I can't do this. Yeah, but you know, I think if you do though, there that provides more value to the comment section. You know, to mm-hmm. uh, the 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 other issue is that uh, I don't know if you agree with this, but the vast majority of the people that are really bought in, or the people that really have the information, or who are mm-hmm. who are following along with the information and evolving their knowledge base, they don't mm-hmm. comment. They just mm-hmm. don't. Uh, yeah. And so, so the commenters are a microcosm of a certain type. Uh, it's true. And, and then, you know, there's an occasional comment from the people that you really value as, as, a, as a viewer or as an audience member or someone who's mm-hmm. a part of your community. But the yeah. vast majority of it's a, it's a really small subset of a certain type uh, that doesn't necessarily represent the whole. You know, and you kind of have to remember that when you're watching the videos or w- reading the comments, because, yeah, like you said, they're not representative of the majority of the people who watch your videos and love the content and are really dialed in. It's one of the reasons I struggle with reviews, right? Mm -hmm. Actual like Amazon reviews or product reviews, um, Mm -hmm. or even like go to B and H, you know, B and H is probably one of the more reliable review sources of crowdsourced reviews, but there's a certain subset of people. Like, I don't think I've ever left a review in my life. Like I don't just don't, just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, if I'm not leaving a review, then other people like me aren't leaving a review. And honestly, I'm the type of person that I'd probably want to re- read a review from. Yeah, totally. And so, uh, you know, reviews in general, I find to be very useless in, in mm-hmm. almost all instances. In fact, I don't ever read them because I find that uh, unless I find someone like you who is a, who is a viable reviewer that I'm going to specifically for the curated solution that crowdsourced reviews really have very little value to me personally. Yeah. And a lot of the Amazon reviews, they can be faked or you'll buy something from Amazon and they're like, Oh, leave us a five star review and we'll give you a discount or we'll give you a free, whatever, whatever. So it's like, you know, is it somebody who really is telling the truth? Is it somebody who's like, Oh, I just brought the product two days ago and it's been working great so far. And it's like, okay, Mm. but how well do you really know the product? So it's tough sometimes to find good quality sources of information to review, especially when there's so many people who would, create like Amazon websites with reviews that are just geared toward affiliate links and they don't actually even know the product. They'll just do a basic article or comparison review without actually even knowing what they're talking about. And the whole goal is just to drive traffic to their website and then get you to click through their Amazon links. So like it can be tricky to find people who really know what they're talking about and Mm -hmm. can give you the information that would most benefit you. Do you find that people, people are skeptical of your, you know, we just talked about all the back end work, all the extra work, all the off camera work. Do you mm-hmm. find that there's a, a subset of uh, of people that still don't believe you, that don't trust you, that don't 
usually I've noticed those are the people who are relatively new to my channel. Mm -hmm. um, and they think I'm sponsored by a manufacturer. Uh, yeah. I'm paid off by whoever. That's I really only hear that from people who don't know me yet. Mm -hmm. And then once you learn a little bit more about me and you're like, look, I'll recommend whatever it works. If a V1 is the best product for you, go get it. Like I think it's a great detector. Mm -hmm. I have no way of making money when you buy it unless you go to Amazon and pay more than full retail because Valentine, they only sell direct. Right. And so if you want to do it, you have to go to V1's website. And I have no way of making any sort of affiliate commission off that. Um, the only people like separately that would resell it would just bump the price, sell it for more than full retail so you can make your cut. Sure. But then you don't get any warranty as the buyer because mm -hmm. you're not buying it from V1. You're technically so, buying it secondhand, yeah. So I could certainly link to Amazon instead of people buying it for 400, they would pay 480 or whatever uh, back when V1s were still available. But mm -hmm. like to me, it's just a business decision to say like, yes, I'm going to be missing out on a little bit of money. But I think that I definitely need the money to make a living and keep doing these videos. But I've always said, like, I'm going to focus on what's the best information for the person watching and what do they need, regardless of whether or not I get paid. Mm -hmm. And that's just something like I've had to come to terms with. And I've decided very early on, like, that's what I wanted when I was first getting into it. And I wish when I was learning, I went with somebody who would have recommended me uh, the V1 as opposed to a detector he could make money off of. And so like I was, I felt kind of burned by that. And so that for me has always just been kind of a personal thing to make sure I recommend what's best for the person and not just what I would make money off of or not because a manufacturer is paying me for a sponsored review or something. So like I don't do any of that kind of stuff. I just test everything. I'll share what I think. You may agree or disagree. It's fine if you think a detector looks good and I don't like the design of it. Cool. There's always going to be a subjective element to it. But I'm going to tell you what I actually think, good and bad. And it's going to be backed up by a lot of data and testing and talking to other people. But I'm going to tell you what I actually think, good or bad. And I think as people start to see that, they're like, oh, this guy's telling the truth. And even if I wasn't and if I was to lie, anybody can go out and test the same stuff I'm doing. And you can call me out and show something I was saying was wrong. Like, <laughs> It's so easy for anybody to go out and get a radar gun and do this kind of test. And if I say this detector performs better than that one, but then 15 other people say the different, like something else is going on, there's clearly something going on with my tests or my reviews or my detector or something. Something is amiss here. So because there's so many other people that are also doing it, if I was to suddenly start lying, there's other people who are going to like, there's, there's good checks and balances there which I really, really like. And that's one of the but, reasons I'm always encouraging more people to test. But Ariel, you've changed. In the beginning, you weren't getting any money for it. <laughs> but now you're telling me that this is your job. You've mm -hmm. changed. You're not the same. It's not the same. That's funny. I don't actually really get that too much. I, I totally understand <laughs> that, which is, I think, kind of why I'll tell a little bit of the story of like why I'm still willing to do it, even though money is now involved. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to, like realistically, if you're going to do this full time, you have to get paid. Yeah. As well, unless you're somehow making money on the side or you've, you know, won the lottery on the side or you have some other source of income. If this is what you're spending your time doing, you have to find a way to make money. And then once you do that, you just have to kind of make your own decision on what you're willing to do and what you're willing to compromise your values on in order to make money. And that's just a personal decision that everybody has to kind of work through. But some people get to decide how much money you're allowed. You know, some people make that decision for you. How much, how much money is too much money for you? You know, yeah. that, the, the crowd, the crowd can turn on you if you're not careful. You know, totally. And I wonder about that too. Some of the people who watch my videos, I mean, they make way more money than I do. Like they've got five cars, they've got 10 cars. Like, right. you know, I, I live here in Seattle. There's a lot of Microsoft people with a ton of money or like mm -hmm. there's people out there with a lot more money than me. There's YouTubers who make a ton of money. And I don't necessarily think money is a bad thing. I just think it's makes it it just kind of amplifies who you are uh, and yep. it makes it easier for you to like help people. It makes it easier for you to be more willing to compromise your values. If you're a little questionable, it makes it, it just, I just think it amplifies who you are. It well, doesn't actually change you. Everything you're talking about is that, um, and this is the point I'm tr trying to drive here is that every, every word out of your mouth is passion, passion, passion. You know, I'm into this. I like this. I'm doing that. And the money that you get from it is a result, right? It's, it's a, a result, result yeah. of, of all this testing that you're doing for nothing, right? The, 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 yeah. the, the, the testing is so that you have the body of knowledge so that then you can maybe provide uh, a resource to people so that then you can then possibly maybe send somebody a link somewhere that then may lead to some revenue, 
uh, totally. or may, may lead to someone hiring you to consult or may lead mm-hmm. to somebody watching a video, which may lead to some revenue. And so totally. everything you're talking about is I'm going to do what I love, do what I love, do what I love, do what I love, do what I love. I'm going to try to avoid as much as I can getting distracted from what I love. Mm-hmm. And then I might get paid. And if yeah, I don't, I mean, I'll figure out how to survive kind of thing. You know? Yeah. Like, I mean, obviously you have to make money and you can't like go to the opposite extreme and say, Oh, I'm not going to take any money because I'm trying to not be changed by the money and stuff. But yeah, I mean, the focus is or the focus. The focus is definitely the passion. Yeah. And then just saying like, okay, money is obviously important too. You need it to survive, to pay the bills, to eat. So it's a necessity. It's a requirement. If I want to get better cameras or maybe hire somebody to help me edit videos, the money right. is what's going to help me do that. So yes, it's a necessity. Um, and I guess we could have the discussion on how much is too much or is it bad to make a ton of money? Mm-hmm. You know, we could have that discussion too, but yeah, I mean, I guess if you're just focused on doing something you love and you're able to help contribute to others and make their lives better, like that's inherently so rewarding and satisfying that I don't know. I love that. That's the main focus here. I feel like I'm making a difference and I'm helping people and that's the inherent reward. So you've got a family, right? Mm -hmm. How do you shut down your passion or is it ever present? Is it always there? Is it, does it, does it intrude in your, in your, in your life? It's funny. My wife and I have been having the discussion recently of like, I don't want to know all the details about your business and everything you're doing. So like, I'm even having to gauge the dynamics of how much do I share with her and how much do I not share with her if she's not necessarily interested in the details. Like she runs a radar detector in her car and she runs a dash cam too. And laser jammers, like she finds all the stuff helpful, but she doesn't want to know all the intricate details of what's going on. So I just set it up for her and I let it run in the background and she's good. So it's, I guess like, I mean, she wouldn't be running that stuff if I wasn't in the picture. It's, I guess my passion sort of bleeding into that. Um, but I guess it's a tricky thing of like, well, that's always going to be there. And you're just excited about living life. And what if I'm not doing this, I'm playing with my daughter and I love how much she smiles and she laughs. Like it's the greatest thing ever. And now it's funny, I guess the passion, this has become not to say more of a job, but there's another purpose of like helping take care of my family. My daughter just turned uh, seven months old today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like when she was born and now it's not just, oh, I'm making YouTube videos and it's fun and this is my passion and oh, I'm making money too. That's cool. But now you start to see a sense of, well, this is also what's helping us financially take care of her, of me being able to take care of my family. I guess it does kind of change things when you're taking care of your kids Mm -hmm. than it does when you're just making videos because it's fun. So I think it's like the passion becomes more purposeful and more of a necessity and a practicality but it's always there it's just kind of repurposed in a way could you see that you know so here, here's what happens often with um with like ceos or titans of industry or you know you you see a lot of divorce and things like that and in, in you know family estranged families because the guy or the girl goes mm-hmm. to work every day and says i'm doing this i'm working 19 hours a day for them mm-hmm. but you're really doing it for you you know, so mm-hmm. this is one of the things I struggle with all the time is that I have a hard time detaching because mm-hmm. I love doing what I'm doing and I would do it for free. I would do it all day. I want to do it all day. I want to do it every day to the totally. point of, I don't, I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to, I don't want to go and me, you know, prepare meals. I don't want to do anything. I don't mm-hmm. want to, I don't want to do anything but this. Yeah. And so do you find that the passion, you know, tends to spill into like, I can't, I I don't want to say I can't, I don't go and like sit on a beach and just detach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like I would have my laptop there with me and I'd be working on stuff and I have a really hard time with, you know, workaholism, if you will. Have you, have you, have you found any of that in your life? How how do you manage that? That's been, I guess, kind of tough to set the limits when you love what you do and like you can kind of say, okay, well, I'm going to go to the gym because otherwise that, that gives me energy so I can be better on camera like that I feel better in my body when I'm working out or if I stop I notice I'm starting to get fatter on camera like oh there we go you know (laughs) or I need to go and stop working to go eat food so I can have the energy to focus on this conversation or so I can like really think about it like the other things that you would be easy to kind of set aside you realize how important they are so that you can continue focusing on your passion Um, but it's so easy to kind of go to the extreme and say I'm going to work weekends I'll be up in the middle of the night reading patents on whatever to learn how something is working. Like 
I've actually had to set boundaries for myself to say, okay, I'm not going to work on the weekends normally, maybe. And sometimes I will, if it's important, but you know, my wife works normal job, you know, she goes to work, comes back Monday through Friday, and she doesn't work on the weekends. But before we got together, I would work weekends because I work from home. And so the idea of days of the week or weekends meant nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The only difference was maybe like, was it easier to go to the grocery store because there was less traffic or more traffic on a weekend versus a weekday or something like there's, it's irrelevant. And so once you realize, oh, she kind of has her time schedule, I have to kind of adopt that. And I want to spend some of my time with family, not just working, 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 but it's tough sometimes when I'm constantly reading the forums or reading YouTube comments or creating notes for the next video that I want to do, or I want to come down and improve something or test something or try something out. Like it's tough sometimes to actually detach Mm -hmm. and to enjoy other stuff and not turn it into a video or I want to go for a drive because I love driving but I'm also running a couple dash cams so I can use this as an opportunity to test something and make sure everything is set up. Like I can make a lot of things overlap with the Mm -hmm. fun or, Oh, we're going to go on vacation to the beach. I'll bring a radar detector for the rental car. Like it's easy to kind of have it all tie in and it can be tough sometimes. like you're saying to truly detach and have something be not work related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never understood it, but the, the whole, you know, workaholism thing, and I just didn't understand how that could be possible. It's because I had jobs that I, I thought I liked, but mm-hmm. I didn't even really like them, let alone love them. Yeah. And now, now that I found something I love, um, it's hard to shut it off. It's hard to shut it down, you know, and, it's and, true. I, and I always find ways and, and I, I'm especially good at multitasking, you yeah. know, where, where, which is, which is also a bad thing because mm-hmm. I, like, even in like college, I do, I would, I would do so much better if I was, planning out the home theater I was going to buy and writing down pricing and adding it up while listening to the lecture. I would just uh-huh. do better at, at absorbing if I did that. And so and now in my adult life, like I'll be, a, I'll be, a, you know, somewhere at something and, uh, and I'll be multitasking and mm-hmm. people just assume that I'm not interested when, yeah. if I'm more interested, it's when I'm multitasking. And so, yeah, it's, it's been a struggle for me and that, that, that kind of detachment of passion, versus versus you know real life and what you know what i i, I call them you know, regular people non-afflicted people um, <laughs> um are able to or i'm so envious of their their ability to detach from things yeah uh, but there's a byproduct of that as well and a lot of times those people aren't particularly successful uh and so there's this this kind of um uh how do i say it it's like this this tendency that the tendencies re, there's a reinforcement to mm-hmm. to why I need to be plugged in all the time, mm-hmm. so it's it's making me think about it. And I've had ebbs and flows personally where I'm back on a on a on a negative streak where I've taken on too much uh, mm-hmm. and taken on and gone to, and traveled too much and did and taken on too many opportunities to really enjoy any of it. Uh, and mm-hmm. so that that can be a struggle as well with well, at least for me with passion chasing. You totally. Know, is chasing too far, too hard, too fast, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so you, you continue to chase, um, you know, the, there's some new technologies coming out, which will, you know, continue to invigorate the passion. Mm-hmm. What if someday you're bored with it? I've thought about that. What happens if I lose the interest or what happens if we get self-driving cars and nobody's driving their cars anymore? Or what happens if every car gets dash cams built in? And so you don't need aftermarket ones like Audi started doing some uh, like Audi ones. Uh, the Teslas have the new sentry mode. So they're getting dash cams built in uh, the new Corvettes for track mode have dash cams. So I, I wonder about that sometimes, like what happens if the stuff that I focus on isn't required anymore, it's not necessary or whatever. Like I'm not that concerned about it, to be honest, if it happens, I'm okay with changing and focusing on something else. Like I love, reviewing. I love sharing what I think. I mean, I've written reviews for my vacuum cleaners or from the lights. Like I just love testing and sharing things. Uh, I've been meaning to do a review on my security system in my car or in my car, uh, in my house, as far as like the cameras that I installed or the NAS. And I just love learning stuff and, you know, sharing what I find. And maybe it would be kind of tricky for my YouTube channel to then pivot to a completely new subject. Uh, That might be tough just because I would would I lose my existing audience? Would they follow because it's something else they're also interested in? Would I get new audience? That's a big thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that I actually thought about was uh, when our daughter was born, I was like, oh, I'm researching you know, baby monitors and 
strollers and all this kind of stuff. What if I just did the exact same thing? <laughs> uh, and so I actually started up a YouTube channel, Vortex Daddy, where I was going to be reviewing uh, different baby products because I'm testing it and researching it anyway, and I'm already doing it. I didn't realize how difficult it is to have a newborn at home and how much time it takes and how the sleep dep deprivation, like I barely had time to even work on my main channel. I think I took a break for like two months um, and just all the baby stuff before I could even start a second channel. Like I didn't realize the, the all of the other time constraints and stress and everything that was involved. So I decided to just can that idea. But uh, my wife and I, we go to a, uh, like a parent baby class every week. We've got an awesome instructor and great friends we've been going with uh, since all of our babies were born. And so I've actually started working with her. She's been doing this for like 25 or 30 years. And I mean, she travels around, she lectures, she's hilarious. She's full of ton of knowledge and experience. And instead of me being a baby expert reviewer, whatever, whatever, which really isn't my passion. Plus Luna's going to be grown up pretty soon anyway. I'm actually working with her to help her start up a YouTube channel and uh, grow that where she's got so much knowledge and experience and she would be amazing at it. And people keep asking her to start up a YouTube channel. So instead of me being the face for like a baby review channel, I've actually found somebody else who would be awesome for that. And I'm going to work with her to help create a channel, which is going to help so many parents. Like we've benefited so much from it that it would just be my honor to help her get this, everything she has to share with millions and millions of parents around the world. So I, from a business perspective, yeah, I can help her and we can grow that. And that helps me diversify and also covers my bases in case what happens if radar detectors are no longer interesting or a law is passed to make everything illegal or whatever, you know, like what if that happens? It's kind of a, a nice diversification strategy, I think. So what, what was your job before you started doing this? Were you an engineer? Yeah. I mean, I went to school for electrical and computer engineering. Mm -hmm. um, I got super burned out of being smart and nerdy and sitting in a lab and like designing processors and testing fiber optic cables and working with antennas and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, I just, I like the physics behind it, but I hated just everything else that was involved. And I wound up doing photography for a while. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of rejected all the engineering stuff. Uh, I spent a year road tripping around the country and I would take pictures and like sell photos along the way. And I would go camping. I would meet with friends. I hosted a TV show. So I just did all this random stuff. I was a car salesman for like a few years or something. Um, just cause I loved cars and I'm like, well, I need to find a way to make money. And that was an easy thing to do. It, I wound up being the guy who's like helping everybody with the tech in their car and pairing their phone with Bluetooth and explaining the nav and all that kind of stuff. So I've always kind of been involved with tech stuff in general in various ways. Um, and then the YouTube thing was not something that I planned on doing for a living. It was like, okay, well I got some free time at the dealership. I'm going to go sit on the side of the road and shoot my radar guns at cars going by and just learn how radar equipment works. Or I'm going to go test different stuff when I've got free time. And I would just start making videos because I just loved it and wanted to learn. And then kind of like what you were saying before, where if somebody is like, Oh, Hey, this was super helpful. I'm going to buy a radar detector based on your tests or your thoughts. I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, I guess if you're going to buy something, here's an affiliate link. Mm -hmm. You're going to spend money anyway. It might as well help me out too. Thanks. And so it was kind of something that sort of naturally started to evolve because it's just what I was doing on the side. And then it kind of started to dawn on me. Oh, I could do this for a living. Uh, okay. I mean, Cool. And so how long was it into you doing that full time? Did you believe it? What do you so mean now, I believe it? So now you believe it. You're like, well, I could just go do this basically business. I felt you're building a business, right? And so you you now believe it to the point where you're like, well, if this shut down tomorrow, who cares? I'll do this. I'll do that. I could do this. You're not saying I'm going to go get a job at a bank. I'm going to go yeah. be an engineer. I'm going to go <laughs> work for somebody else. You're, you believe it. So yeah. how long was it before you actually believed it? You know, when you were doing it, did you have some apprehension saying, well, you know, uh, at least, you know, tomorrow I can go work for a bank kind of thing. That's a good question. Yeah. I don't remember the exact time frame or how long it took. I mean, it started off really slow and took a while to grow. It took a couple of years to get to the point where I could actually make a living off of it. And so it wasn't something where I was like, oh my gosh, I'm overnight making a ton of money. I can quit my job and I can stop. It was kind of something that started to grow. And I'm like, oh, I'm making money on the side over here. Mm -hmm. Eventually I can devote more resources and time and energy to it. But I mean, it took me a little while, actually, probably a couple of years until I was. So when you walked away from a job and a side hustle to the side hustle becoming the, 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 the primary, uh, mm -hmm. then it, did it take you a while to then just 
be accepting that, hey, instead of it being like, well, I could do this for a little while to saying, I got this. Yeah. I mean, I remember like when I stopped working at the car dealership, I wasn't at the point where financially I was able to pay all the bills. So I racked up some credit card debt trying to just, I really, really wanted to make this work. So you started pushing hard and like, okay, let's create this. Let's make the test. Let's do the videos. And then like, eventually you make more money and okay, you pay back down the debt and stuff. So there was kind of this gap between, okay, I'm going to commit to this full term even though it's not yet where I want it to be, I know this is what I want to do. So I'm just going to go for it. Mm -hmm. And I believe in it so much that I just have to go this route. And then you wind up making more money and you pay off the debt and stuff. So it's kind of like an investment in yourself, I guess is how I see it. Mm -hmm. And if you believe in yourself and what you do and know this is what you want to give to people and you enjoy it so much, then you just go for it. Mm -hmm. And it's scary to kind of metaphorically jump off a cliff like that and not know if it's going to even work out. And you're like, you're a, you're going to be a YouTuber for a living. That's a thing. What? <laughs> it, it's yeah. I mean, it's, I remember talking to my wife about it. She was like, what do you mean? This isn't a real job. How do you make money? Like you're going to make money because people want to listen to you talk about radar detectors. What? Like <laughs> <laughs> it's just a weird thing to So would you wake up that around. next morning and say, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. I'm going to maybe, uh, you know, I thought about actually like, should I go get another job that I know can pay me a lot more? especially Mm -hmm. when I'm getting started. And yeah, we had to go through that and like, okay, am I going to be able to grow this to the point where financially it's going to be sustainable to where I can make enough money to, Mm -hmm. you know, that was actually a tough discussion we had to have because at first, no, it wasn't there. And when we first met, no, I wasn't really doing all that great financially. I'm doing better now. But in the beginning, like it was actually pretty tough. And remember we were having my wife and I having a discussion about this. It was kind of an issue because I was like really wanting to commit to it as an entrepreneur yeah. But she didn't really understand how it works or if it would be successful or would it be viable long term. So it was actually like a tough thing that we had to go over and really talk about. And I mean, I'm glad it's working out. I'm glad she stuck through me and believed in me. I mean, but <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was tough at first. Yeah, it took me a while. I mean, uh, you know, I left my career in June of uh, 18 and it was probably about... Um, I would say late summer of last year when it just, when it clicked with me that I got this, Mm -hmm. you know, that, 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 uh, yeah, this is, this is, this is going to work. Uh, and, and now, now I'm in the, in the place where, you know, am I going to have to raise capital? Um, how am I going to manage cash flow? Cause now I'm writing $200,000 inventory checks, not $10,000 inventory checks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and to, to buy inventory and to bring in a product and to sell it. And, and so now I'm toying with this idea of, you know, leverage, you know, what do I leverage? What risk do I take? You know, how much do I finance myself? Do I bring on mm-hmm. a partner, you know, which I don't want to do, you know, how do, how do I do this? And so it's been a, it, th- there's been this trend, th- these, these transitions from, um, you know, this is, uh, this was a fun little side hustle. Uh, or actually it was just fun. And then it was a fun little side hustle. And then it became mm-hmm. an inconvenience. My job became an inconvenience to my side hustle. And then yeah. my job was ta- you know, basically taken away. And oh my mm-hmm. gosh, now I'm going to go for it to then I'm going to do it all by myself. Now I've got 10 people and I got 15 people. Now I'm responsible for them. So there's this transition of, yeah. uh, of believing it. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and different, different, uh, levels of believing it. And yeah, I, totally. I find it difficult at times. You know? I think it helps. Like the more you believe in it, the more you take it seriously. So like I've started listening to podcasts on business development and marketing mm-hmm. and just learning about the different aspects of what it means to, you know, I've been learning about outsourcing recently and hiring people to help mm-hmm. me with various aspects of the business. Like it's, it's a transition to once, like the more you believe in it and the more you start taking it seriously and the more you grow it. Mm-hmm. It really it, changes things. It'll be interesting to see how you how you take to that. You know, a lot of business owners eventually they'll they'll tiptoe into into delegation and tiptoe into hiring people. And then when you realize you get to a point where you realize you're no longer like you're no longer just you you know, row in the boat that you've got to you've got to go in the back and steer and plug the holes and and you're you're managing people rather than rather than doing the doing. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, it's been a pretty significant transition from a, you know, from a, from a understanding what people want from me, uh, Mm -hmm. for, for, from a customer client or audience base, understanding Mm -hmm. what they want, 
Uh, now it's I need to understand what the people that work for me need uh, mm -hmm. in order to take the organization to the next level, which is very relationship based. Totally. Uh, and so I went from just creating content, just regurgitating, just putting it out there to now mm -hmm. I've got to manage relationships with all these people that are looking to me to, to for them to grow. And it's uh, it's been a it's been an interesting transition. So uh, good luck with what what you have coming up your up your alley. It's not uh, it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what are your to see if you revert back to doing it all all on your own? I'm curious because yeah, I mean, I guess the grass is always greener. Like, oh, it would be nice to have help mm -hmm. focusing on things that I don't necessarily want to do. But then yeah, you get into managing people and I mean, having to pay them and file their taxes and just everything that's involved with hiring and firing and all that. Mm -hmm. Like, are you glad that you've made the transition as a necessity or do you wish you could have? No, life? yeah, I'm, I'm super glad. I mean, it, it's, it's been a, the thing that keeps me up at night is I want to ensure that I'm providing a resource to the people that work for me, a resource for them to grow individually, not just be stuck in a job. The one mm -hmm. thing I, I worry about is I don't want everybody to just show up until they don't show up anymore and then just replace them and put somebody else in their role. I want yeah. people to be able to craft their own life, craft their own ascent. You know, if they're happy with where they are, they can stay there. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to drive and make it so that, you know, Bryce, who is head of media and, and Kyle, who is head of technical support, that they can craft their future life. So, you know, one of the questions I ask them all the time is, you know, what does it look like here at 59 versus 29? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it, what is, what would it look like in a perfect world? And of course, they've never really thought of that. So I want mm -hmm. them thinking about that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I find that to be, um, that, that's what stresses me out. I'm not concerned with paying them. I'm not concerned with my ability mm -hmm. to meet that obligation. Uh, I'm much more concerned with them, uh, you know, not me, not just being a revolving door because I can find an infinite amount of people, you know, sure. you could too, because we have this, you have the resource of the audience of people that will want to come work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the people that to hire is not the hard part. It's once you hire them, how do you continue to stimulate and continue to uh, grow them? Uh, and when that's not my passion, mm -hmm. right? my yeah. passion is not leadership. My passion mm -hmm. is not human development. My passion right. is uh, wax. You know, uh -huh. <laughs> my, my passion is tool organization. Uh, uh -huh. And so, uh, but, but I've, you know, thrust upon myself the need to have at least an understanding of, mm -hmm. of, you know, human growth, if you will. Totally. Uh, and yeah, that so, makes sense. But it's changed the organization. I mean, you know, we've, we're, we're a multi, multi million dollar corporation. Mm -hmm. And uh, out of you making goofy videos on YouTube, and, yeah. And I think I'm I'm headed to a hundreds of million dollar of billion dollar corporation, with That's you exciting. know with hundreds of people. If I want mm -hmm. it, I don't. Mm -hmm. I was just my coaches were just in here before this call, and that was what I was questioning. I'm in a I'm in a. Do I want that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that, and the reason yeah. I'm, I'm questioning that is because I don't I, I don't have a frame of reference for it. You know. Do you? I guess I'm kind of curious because in a sense, like I'm kind of looking at my business now and then looking at where you are and I'm like, okay, how much do I want to grow it in terms of bringing other people on and being responsible for leading other people and all that other stuff. Whereas I like kind of the freedom and the flexibility to not worry about other people's schedules right now. And I can not work. I can work. I, I have a lot more freedom now and I don't necessarily want to give that up, but I'm also seeing there's some areas where it would really help me to bring other people on. So how have you kind of found that balance? As well, you I don't think you'll give any of that up as long as you set up that framework, that agreement in the beginning that again, I don't have a position. Like I don't have mm -hmm. a job, you know, mm -hmm. I have a responsibility. So I'm responsible for the corporation and the people that work for me have a job, you know, they have a position they have to hold. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, you have to spend a lot of time in the beginning in 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 cultivating that understanding and it's it's really pretty simple it's by you know making agreements with each other and then and then and then setting a by when you know by when will you have this done uh, and mm -hmm. so for instance with Bryce you know and and now you're looking for self-starting people right so right. when Bryce came on board everybody's like you can't have an editor because they won't you know they won't know your style and they won't you know, and so I sat down with them and I made the commitment, even though it took me three times as long, I made the commitment to sit down with them and go through the, the video. You know, let me show you how I do it. I did three videos where I edited it. You just watched. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. 
he did three videos where I watched him edit it. And I, you know, I said, well, you know, if I ever do something stupid, always leave that in. You know, like if I bust my knuckle or I, you know, get angry and, you know, and and huff off to the right, always leave that in. Whereas, Mm -hmm. you know, if he didn't know the style, he would have been, oh, I need to make Matt look good. So we need to cut that out. Right. Uh, And so, so little things like that, I had to invest in the, in the, you know, here's what I'm looking for. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then when he was editing videos on his own, I had to give him a, you know, by when do I need this? Okay, this video needs to be up by 3 p.m. today. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so we started to develop some accountability together where now he knows the style. I've confirmed that he can edit it properly. I'm giving him feedback so you can see how much more work this is. I was just freaking, I just wanted to just do the video. I could have just done it in half the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then after doing that for two or three months, I can drop the, the, you know, drop the memory card on his desk and say go to it that's awesome yeah. and then we got to the point to where now he's you know he sets up the camera and so now he has a person who works for him so mike will come and he'll know what angles i need but we had to invest in him and so bryce invested in mike to get mike up to speed with that same thing that i did with him and mm-hmm. then mike will do the same thing with his you know his successor and his successor so that everybody can continue to elevate same mm-hmm. thing with shipping like if you ask me to go, if you bought like $200 worth of stuff in my store and asked me to go ship it, I don't even know how to do it. Mm-hmm. I built it. <laughs> I created it. I set up the software. I built the website. I did everything. But now it's evolved past me. I don't yeah. even know. I wouldn't even know how to physically go and do it. Just like now, like I don't even have the intros and outros of the videos. So I don't have the, you know, the transitions. I don't have all of the, the, the stuff I need. I don't have the logos. I mean, I can mm-hmm. get it. I know where it is. Uh, but mm-hmm. I don't have instant instant access to it, so it would take me now. It would take me three times longer to do what the team does. Uh, but that you know that takes the investment up front, which is really frustrating to do. Um, that makes sense. But, but if you can go into it looking at the now, I show up on set uh, and I don't touch the cameras, I don't touch the memory cards, I don't edit the video, I don't write the description, I don't tag the videos, I don't put the the, you know, the monetization in, they all know the way that I want it because we invested in the beginning and Mm -hmm. that's super, super powerful. Yes. And so now the next step is, so imagine that. So you're taking everything, you know, and having people do it. Now for me, I'm at the stage where I'm having to have people do things that I don't know. Mm Mm-hmm. That, that I don't uh, like barcode scanning and, and getting conveyor belts and things like that. I don't know that. So mm-hmm. how do I get the people that I've hired to do the job to own their position and solve those problems together? You know, mm-hmm. where I'm making the final say, the final decision, but where I'm not creating the solution. And that's, it's hard. It's taxing. <laughs> Yeah. But then, you know, next year when I'm talking to you, I'll be talking to you with the same confidence I just did when I talked to you about how I cultivated Bryce and got him to edit the videos the way I wanted him edited. Uh, I'll totally. probably be having the same conversation about all these things that I don't understand mm-hmm. that we will have solved between now and then. And because, you know, to do, you know, to do a little bit of, of revenue and do a little bit of, of business is easy to do by yourself, but to do a lot, you, know, you need other people. You really do. Yeah. Yeah, but then, you know, then then I'll I'll, you know, again money is just a result. I'll be mm-hmm. able to go where I want to go and do what I want to do for and then possibly create intergenerational wealth and and mm-hmm. hopefully my kids will have a leg up over other children that that they'll see how it's done and we'll never have that that question where you just say, well, if this if no one was detailing their cars anymore, I'll just go do this or do I'll do the same, I'll do it here or there. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's, um, it's, it's interesting when that happens, when that click, I can see it click in you that like, there's no more like, could I do this? It's mm-hmm. I'm doing this. And if right. it didn't work, I'd do that or do this. It's not, I'm going to, I'll go work at McDonald's if I have to, you would never have to do that. You know? Yeah, no, this is awesome. You're setting it up like for life. And I mean, I'm kind of wondering the same questions of like, Oh, will my kids want to be a YouTuber or will they want to run their own business? Are they going to have the entrepreneurial spirit? Are they going to be interested in radar detectors or maybe want to 
make videos about something else or maybe do something else entirely. Who knows? I think the key is they'll have the ability to not to, to get rid of precluding themselves from things. Mm-hmm. You know, I know I grew up and I didn't know I was an entrepreneur. I never knew I was getting in trouble all the time at, you know, corporate, corporate jobs. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, I would reach a ceiling of what, you know, was created and then I would see an opportunity and I would want to push outside of that box and it would always get me in trouble. So I'd follow the rules to a T until the rules needed to be rewritten and then I would get in trouble, you know, like real trouble, like, you know, get, you know, and, and, and to the point of, you know, I got fired from my last position of, mm-hmm. uh, and, um, and because I pushed the limits of what was, what, what should have been and what should be. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it wasn't my company to do that. And so, you know, being an entrepreneur, I'm hoping my kids could see at least they have the opportunity to do that, that they wouldn't preclude themselves from, from doing any, you know, doing something they loved. It also yeah. gives me the ability to, you know, send them to college with no agenda. They can mm-hmm. go to college and, and major in something they're interested in rather than being forced to do something just to get a job. And that totally. largely will afford them the ability to then choose their own path in the future, likely. Yeah. Were your parents like really supportive of the entrepreneurial spirit? No. In general? No, no, no. no. no they weren't. No. Well, my parents work for me now. So um, <laughs> they, run, they run the operation. They run a distribution operation. Um, uh-huh. But, you know, they were very nine to fiver. Or actually, they were, you know, seven to nine PMers, you know, and just mm-hmm. go and do what you got to do. Uh, and so for whatever reason, you know, they afforded me the ability to, um, you know, I went to college and no one else did. My family, my sister didn't go. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, and I just, you know, you talk about leaving and cleaving. I just cleaved, I left and mm-hmm. uh, detached and just chose my own path. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and they never slowed me down. They never That's said, cool. you know, I don't know about this. You shouldn't do that. And oh, now they've really cool. made, they've taken the risk and come here and work mm-hmm. for something that's unproven. You yeah. Know, moved, moved, you know, moved from Pennsylvania to Florida. And so, mm-hmm. you know, they must kind of believe in the, the, the methodology. So evidently, and it's working great. That's super exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. I'm in a phase, if you can see it in my face where I'm just worn out of, just it, this sounds ridiculous, but just too much opportunity. I have mm-hmm. too many cars, too many new products, too many new employees, too much opportunity, too many cool things, too many toys to play with, mm-hmm. uh, and I have to slow down to speed up. It's funny. That's kind of where I'm at. Like I get twelve emails a week from companies saying, "Hey, could you review my dash cam?" And I'm like, "Do you know how much is involved to do one?" I, yeah. There's no way I can do all that much. You're like, I've got. But then you'll convince yourself at 3 a.m. You're like, you know, I think, uh, let me just schedule it. I'll schedule let it like four weeks it. out. Yeah. Let me do that. Let me just get a bunch. And I mean, I forgot how much was involved last time I tried to do it, but no, I'm better now. I can, I can manage all that. And, yeah. and then your list of videos you want to create just keeps growing and growing. And you're like, oh, I know I yeah. got to get an article version of it, a video version. But then you of it. start believing that other people know what you're planning. Right. Mm-hmm. Do you ever get this? I'm like, everybody knows that I'm going to come out with this product and that lift and that product. So I've got to do it. I need mm-hmm. to do it. I need to do it right now because everybody knows, but no one has a freaking clue. Nope. Um, I'm like, you know, I, I need to do it right now. I'm not even in competition with anybody. No one's competing with me. And nope. yet I am have this overwhelming, crushing desire to get it done. Yeah. You know? You know, and, and then, and what the worst thing that can happen to me, I don't know if this happens to you, but I'll have a week where I'm caught up Mm -hmm. and I'm like, what am I going to do next? And I will create 47 things to do (laughs) that will take another year and a half to get done. If I Uh have like five minutes of reprieve. So mm-hmm. I, I have to, I have to be careful. Of that. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to not like overwhelm myself too much. Like I was for the end of the year, it was the best blah, 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 you know, best radar detectors, best dash cams. And that was a big push, especially before leaving for a month long trip for vacation with the family. Mm-hmm. And now I'm kind of like easing back into it and I'm testing new stuff again, but I'm not in a huge rush to try to overwhelm myself again. So I'm trying to just like be a little bit easier. Like I got my dog who just came join me sitting on my lap now or, just trying to 
take things a little bit easier and not overwhelm myself because that's so easy to do. And I totally have a tendency of doing that as well. So it's tough to take a step back and not feel guilty about it or feel like you're lazy or feel like you're not yeah. living up to your expectations when mm. you could be doing so much more, but you need, you just like you have to kind of slow down. <sighs> yeah. Well, yeah. you know, remember we we're talking a little bit about going to the gym. Mm -hmm. Well, rather than like going on a diet and, you know, running a little bit, I bought a gym. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. So now I own CrossFit dialed in. And so uh -huh. now I have a whole nother business where I'm, I'm now beholden to, and I bought a building that we had to move into last week and I signed uh -huh. up for a marathon. Um, oh man. You know, so just to, to, so now I'm on the hook. I already paid for it. I'm going to, you know, have committed. and other people going with me and, uh, and, and, uh, and then, you know, I basically worked myself the last week. So I'm sick, you mm -hmm. know, it's just, uh, and so what I did is I called the next three trips that I'm, I have planned and I just said, I'm just, I just can't do it. I'm just not going mm -hmm. yeah. I'm supposed to go to Arizona. I'm supposed to go to a couple other places. I'm like, I'm just, I'm going to stay home, play with all these toys that I got. Yeah. And, uh, I'm going to sell a couple of cars. Uh, mm -hmm. because the projects are done. I'm not going to do a big project like that anytime soon. I'm going to mm -hmm. simplify my life a little bit and, uh, and focus on, you know, focus on what I, what it is I love because I'm getting, so I've, I always narrow things and then that narrowing always stays narrow, but the narrow part gets big. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, like it's, totally. even though it's narrow, there's a lot of things in there that can get really big. Uh, mm -hmm. And so every time I narrow, I narrow down, but then the narrowing eventually widens out inside of that niche. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, uh, that seems to be the cycle with like, you take on a lot and then you have to kind of pull back and narrow it down, but that inevitably it's going to get bigger and wider again. And yeah. you're like, oh, this is exciting. All these new things that I'm learning or sharing or doing or whatever. And then you yeah. have to like kind of narrow it again. And that kind of seems to be the pattern with this. I never understood, you know, my friend Adam LZ has, you know, about 3 million subscribers and he he's never had a job and he's mm -hmm. always all stressed out. I'm like, dude, you don't have a freaking job. You, you make tons of make millions of dollars and you just make videos. And yet I get it now. I totally mm -hmm. get it. When you have mm -hmm. so much opportunity, uh, yeah. you can run yourself ragged, which is just the most, anybody listening to this podcast right now who gets up, <laughs> just, just think this is the most ridiculous conversation they've ever heard in their life. But I'm telling you, I would have thought mm -hmm. it was the most ridiculous thing ever. Totally. Then that's kind of the theme of this podcast is, you know, chasing passion, managing that passion, managing your life around it, staying, you know, staying in your lane, this whole thing that I've kind of gotten on with the, the speech yeah. that I made at, at, at the G-Technic Summit as a, Anytime I make a speech, I'm always trying, I'm talking to myself, mm -hmm. attempting to work out in my head what's going on with my life. Uh, and the whole staying in your lane thing is so hard to do. It's know? funny. Like there's this old saying of we teach what we most need to learn. Mm -hmm. And that's super true. It's like, that's what we're teaching is what we are really into and wanting to focus on yeah. and develop and grow. And, and that's, it's a tough thing to like really dial in as the opportunities grow. It's what do you really want to focus on? What do you love? What are you going to be successful at what's going to benefit people the most? And then it's not somebody telling you what you're supposed to do for your job. It's like really trying to look at the big picture and seeing what is going to be the best to focus on and what needs to be cut out of a sense of practicality. And how do you balance all that? That's yeah. And that doesn't have to be a, a business that you own. That may not be your thing. It can be inside of a, a corporation. It can be inside of a, you know, a job, but mm -hmm. the, the key, I think the key message here, and we'll wrap it up with that is that, you know, you, you want to figure out what you love that way. You don't have to go to work every day. Gosh, I couldn't imagine that. Uh, I would you never know? have it any other way. It's so much better. Yeah. And, and, you know, a good, that could be working for Google or Facebook or Amazon, or it could be working for the manufacturing plant down the street. It could be selling cars. It could be, you know, doing whatever it is. But, you know, if everybody just kind of reshuffled, just think mm -hmm. about how productive business would be. You know, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm hoping to create here is that I want people that are here that want to be here and want to, want to pursue and not yeah. just here because they need a, they need a dollar, you know? Yeah. And it's like, not everybody has to be an entrepreneur or even should be like, no, not everybody God, wants no. to run a business. Like if you like the structure of a job and this, they, you focus on that and there's so many other people who can take care of other things that you don't like or want to do and you don't have to worry about it. 
that's amazing. But whatever it is that you love, like, yeah, please try to figure out a way to do that and make a living doing that. It's yeah. 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 Well, cool, brother. I appreciate the time. I enjoy yeah. the conversation. We'll have to do this again. You, 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 re, you reinvigorated my, um, uh, the, 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 the desire to do interviews. Great. Now I'm going to add more things. To my <laughs> Let's own. add that to the list as well. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for reaching out. I, yeah. Well, well, I'm sure we'll catch up at SEMA or maybe sometime sooner. Uh, I'm sure, sure I'll be out in Seattle at some point. Yeah. But, um, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for the appreciate time. And we'll, time. uh, we'll catch you on the next one.